Like Stephen said, uh, we are currently in a sermon series titled, We Are All Theologians. This is part two. Part one was, what is the gospel? And then we looked at the glory of God. And we were so blown away by the glory of God, we felt like we just need a pause. We can't just move too quickly. We need to pause and just praise him for who he is. Praise God for who he is. He is our father. He is worthy of all the glory. And so we did that last week. We uh, took a moment of just praying and praising him. Him. And for those who were here last week, I hope uh, that you enjoyed it and that you got to experience more of uh, who God is, that he is glorious. He is worthy of it all, worthy of it all. But uh, today we're going to transition a little bit and I'm going to start by asking the question, how can I be right before God? How can I be right before God? God, when you stand before a holy and glorious God, in that moment, nothing else will matter. Dare I say, there is no greater question to be answered than that. And since all of us must face that day, all of us must face that day, no issue is more important than knowing whether you are in right standing with an eternal, glorious, holy God who spoke the universe into existence. The answer to this question is of great importance. And, and this answer, it, it, it hinges on the proper understanding of what many refer to as the biblical doctrine of justification. Some extend it and say justification by faith alone. This doctrine is firstly clearly seen in the Bible in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, which says of Abram, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is not the first time in the Bible that God counted anyone righteous, but it is the first time that the doctrine is clearly stated. Abraham, who uh, had entered into a right standing with God before this time. He had, he had already entered into a right standing with God before Genesis 15 verse six, but it is stated here to show that from start to finish, a person is accepted by God apart from good works and solely on the basis of the righteousness of God that is credited to that person. I know big words sounds confusing on the way you're going. Just hang on for a moment. It'll make sense. See, the Apostle Paul, he quotes this verse, uh, Genesis 15, verse 6. He quotes it twice in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, and then again in Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. And he does so to explain how a person comes into right standing with God. See, because your relationship with God whether you are under his judgment or not, is of extreme importance. I cannot urge you strongly enough to seek and understand this doctrine of justification. Because here's the point. Here's here's, here's the point that I'm making, that that there is coming a day where every knee will bow. Whether you've put your faith in Jesus or not, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Our hope is that you would do so willingly now. This is why the doctrine of justification matters. It secures our positional standing, the place from which we understand our identity in Christ and its implications. It secures it. It allows us to go, no, 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 I'm right with God. I'm good with God. How do you know? Because of justification. See, the... The guilty sinner is declared righteous by God on the basis of Christ's life, death, and resurrection the moment he or she believes and accepts Jesus Christ. Let me read Romans uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. Uh, This will be our text this morning. Uh, We're going to navigate through it. Um, And so I'm going to read it to you so that you hear it. uh, And my hope is that as we walk through it, you would understand it. Um, And so let me read, and then I'll pray briefly, and then we'll jump in. Uh, Because there are four things, four things from uh, this text that we should uh, know so that we might lay hold of this beautiful doctrine that is justification. Romans chapter 4, 
from verse 1. Hear these words of our father. What then will we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now to the one who works, pay is not credited as a gift, but as something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who declares the ungodly to be righteous, his faith is credited for righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of a person to whom God credits righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the person the Lord will never charge with sin. Is this blessing only for the circumcised then? Or is it also for the uncircumcised? For we say faith was credited to Abraham for righteousness. In what way then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? It was not while he was circumcised, but uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while still uncircumcised. This was to make him the father of all who believe but are not circumcised so that righteousness may be credited to them also. Man, that's so beautiful. And he became the father of the circumcised who are not only circumcised but also follow in the footsteps of the faith of our father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. Sounds like a tongue twister but we'll make sense of it in a moment. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. It continued to transform the individual lives of people. And so God, would you do a work that only you can do? Would you heal many? Would you restore many? Would you reconcile many? God, would you save many? Lord, I ask that my words would submit to your word. That my heart would submit to your heart. Help us to see you for who you are. A loving father, full of grace, full of mercy, who gave us his son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you. We praise you. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. All right, four things that I want you to see and understand about this doctrine called justification by faith alone. Here's number one. Justification is God declaring the guilty sinner righteous on the basis of Christ's life, death, death and resurrection, all right? See, most people have the idea that when it comes time for judgment, uh, God, who they conceive as a nice God, will not be harsh as long as a person has been sincere and has tried his or her best to be a good person. That's what most people think. And even if they don't say it, that's how they live. In other words, people will pull God down from his position of absolute righteousness as revealed in the scriptures and make him out to be a tolerant or understanding uh, God who, who's okay with some sins. And let's be honest, we all do this. It's the sins that we don't commit. Like we'll look at other people and be like, Whew, yeah, no, judgment's coming. But, but the sin that you find yourself committing, you'll be like, oh, surely God, you tolerate that. See, the depravity and wickedness of humanity will always move the goalposts. We'll always adjust the standard. But hear me this morning. God does no adjustments. No adjustments. But he does make a substitution. Oh, if you guys were understanding what I was saying, I wouldn't have to be preaching this long. See, we mistakenly and fraudulently conclude that the good God will be nice and let good people into heaven in spite of their sins and shortcomings. But the Bible reveals God to be absolutely holy. And he cannot tolerate sin. And he is absolutely just which means that the penalty for all sin must be paid. He never just brushes sin aside, saying, hey, hey, no, no big deal, don't worry about it. It's all good. 
That, that's not the God who is seated on the throne. Also, the Bible says that if a person keeps all of God's law, but then stumbles only on one, he is guilty of violating the whole law. James chapter 2 verse 10 says this, for whoever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. See, Jesus comes in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he, he comes and he says, listen, I, I, I know you guys, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. And I'm pretty sure lots of people are going, yep, never did, that. never. Never, never committed adultery. I mean, even, even in this room, never. And then Jesus goes, no, 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 hold on. But if you've looked upon another with lustful intent, then you've committed adultery in your heart. Now all of a sudden we're like, hey, wait, wait, could you define what you mean in the heart? Like, what does, you know what I mean? Like, we do that all the time. That's us trying to move the goalposts. Do not commit murder. Yep, never done that. All good. I love flowers. I don't even kill them. I don't even kill the flowers. And then he says, well, if you have anger in your heart towards someone, then you've committed murder in your heart. To keep the whole law and yet stumble on one is to break the entire law. Matthew 5 verse 48, Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's not a suggestion, that is a command. Be perfect. And so what is our response to that? How? I can't. Jesus, I can't be perfect. We have a huge problem. How can a just and holy God maintain his purity and yet be reconciled with people who have violated his commands repeatedly, both in thought and deed? It's a huge problem. And as Paul argues in the first three chapters of Romans, everyone has violated God's law and therefore is under his just condemnation. Paul is arguing, using Abraham as his prime example that no one can gain right standing with God through their works because our works are imperfect. And so we just can't. We have a huge problem. Hence, the need for justification. See, the biblical meaning in both the Hebrew and the Greek for the word justify is to pronounce, accept, and treat as just. I've heard some people say it this way. Justification means just as if you had never sinned. And I like that. I know a couple weeks ago I made fun of it, but I like it. To justify. This is a legal term. We're going to learn some uh, law today. It's a legal term expressing a judicial act of administering the law, in this case by declaring a verdict of acquittal, clearing of all charges, and so therefore dismissing the guilty person. Justification thus settles the legal status of the person and not only declares a person justified, but it changes their entire identity. I need you to hear that. Because for so many of us, we'll go, yeah, I'm justified, but you still live as if like you're guilty. It changes your entire identity. And if it changes your identity, it changes the way you live. See, justification does not mean to make righteous, as some may think, but rather to declare righteous. It is a legal term as used by Paul, and it has two implications, two massive implications. One, the sinner is declared or counted as righteous. There we go, righteous. And then two, the consequence of his or her sins are totally pardoned or forgiven. Done. The, the slate is wiped clean. This is why justification matters. This is why it matters. It declares the guilty sinner innocent. The second thing that you need to see and understand is that the means of justification is faith in Christ's death. Oh, this is a big one. 
This is a big one. The means of justification is faith in Christ's death. See, when Paul quotes Genesis 15, verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. See, at, at first glance, you may think that it, the word it, refers to Abraham's faith. So that God does this exchange with Abraham. It's, I'll take your faith and I'll give you my righteousness. You, we, we think of it as, as a sort of trade. But that would give some sort of merit to the faith, which it does not have. See, in God's ledger in heaven, on the debit side, we learned a little bit of law, now we're doing a little bit of counting. In God's ledger in heaven, on the debit side, is all our sin. No amount of faith would balance that out on the credit side. Because faith cannot pay for sin. I need, I need you guys to hear me. Faith is not the basis of our justification. Rather, it is the means of our justification. Faith is the hand which receives God's provision in Christ. The basis for justification is that the just penalty for sin has been paid by an acceptable substitute. The justice of God must be met. Remember, we're all guilty. We're all guilty. And so therefore, the justice of God must be met and Jesus Christ paid that penalty. Remember what Abraham believed? He looked forward to the promised savior who would be his descendant, right? His seed, and he believed God concerning that savior. God, in a judicial accounting procedure, took Abraham's sin and credited to the book of Jesus Christ who would bear that sin on the cross. He took the righteousness of Jesus and credited to Abraham's book so that Abraham received the very righteousness of God. Friends, I, the, the reason I'm laboring on this is because it has massive implications for how we live. And, and my concern is that many of us go, we believe that, but then we watch your life. And everything, everything is my works, my good works, my good works, my good works. Why? Because somehow I feel like that is how I am justified. Faith was merely the channel by which the transaction took place. Let me, let me give you an example. If you were held captive by a band of terrorists, and then I heard about this, and then I, because I love you so much, organized a commando raid. Anyone remember, like, commando? Arnold Schwarzenegger, no, no, yes, no, no, okay, different crowd. <laughs> and I organized a commando raid where we swept into the camp by helicopter and brought you out to safety. It would be ridiculous for you to later say, it was my faith that saved me. No, no it wasn't. It was a tactically trained team of soldiers who saved you. Your faith was merely the means that allowed you to go, help! They rush in, it's dark, it's chaos, but, but you know, you know, this is the, these are the good guys, and so you go, help! That's your faith. See, in the same way, it is not your faith that saves you from your sin, much less any good deeds. God justifies the guilty sinner through Christ. Faith is simply the means by which his justification is applied to us. See, if you come to God with your sin and say, God, I need help. I need help. I recognize that, that, that I am a guilty sinner and that there is nothing that I can do. 
I need help. That is when we can lay hold of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Not in your faith, but in him. Faith means taking God at his word. It is the channel through which God's promised blessings flow to us. You can be sure of heaven if you have let go of any supposed righteousness or goodness on your own and have laid hold to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross as the just payment for your sins. That's how it works. And my fear is that we've overcomplicated this simple message that is full of marvel. We've added all these different things to it, good things, but those things cannot save you. You know what saves you is, is, is you just realizing where you are and going, I need help. Yeah. And even for a church like ours, highly competent, highly educated people, all of you, I know it. It's so impressive. We believe the lie that I can use those things to stand before a holy and just God. Look at my accolades, God. My degrees. My investment accounts. Are you not impressed? None of those things will save you, friends. The means of justification is faith and faith alone in Christ's death. Third thing I want you to see is the only kinds of people God justifies are the ungodly who recognize that they cannot do any work to be justified and therefore cry out to God for a favor. Because that's what it is. It's a favor. Now, this may come as a shock to many of us, and it does, it does, because it goes against what many of us believe. We've created a, a I think the expression is tit for tad, kind of religion. And we actually prefer it. God, I've done this for you, so you owe me. Paul makes it very clear in Romans chapter four, verse five. He says, but to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. He does not justify those. I'm gonna say something that's gonna sound super weird because I know some of you are going, yes, then therefore we no longer have to do those things. But it doesn't justify you because you show up to a Sunday gathering. It doesn't justify you because you show up to a midweek gathering because you give generously. That's not why he justifies you. But, but I'm not saying those things are not important. In fact, they're very revealing. They put you under a microscope because if that's what you believe, then that means that you have not fully understood what justification means. You're still acting as if if I do all these good things, then God owes me. God justifies only one sort of person, the ungodly of which all of us are. The ungodly, because they are the ones who need justification. It's the sick. Jesus says, I came for the sick. That's who I came for, the sick. And all the Pharisees are, are standing there, the religious leaders of that day going, well, well, I'm perfectly fine. I'm perfectly fine. I know the Bible. I, I show up at the gatherings. Totally fine not recognizing their spiritual need for a savior. It's the ungodly that need justification. And among the ungodly, it's those who do not work for their justification, but believe in Jesus Christ for their salvation. The reality that we cannot work for salvation and that we are not good people who deserve heaven is one of the most difficult things to remove from the proud human heart. It's tough. It's tough. And that's why week in and week out, I plead with you. And I will continue to plead with you because I know the proud human heart. Remember that Abraham was justified by faith because he didn't he didn't do any like great works. He, he hadn't done anything yet. 
and yet he's justified. You cannot and will not be justified in God's sight as long as you think you can earn it or deserve it. You will not be right with God as long as you think of yourself as a good person. We must come to see that we are ungodly sinners who are under God's condemnation and are in desperate need of a savior. This is not a common teaching. It's not, it's not what people like to hear. People don't come to gatherings to hear. Like we just don't. We, we just want to be like, hey, you're loved and it's great and everything's perfect. Just keep doing what you're doing. And that is, that is a, da- friends, that is a dangerous teaching because it makes you the hero of the story. And you are no hero. In fact, before Jesus, you're the villain. But the moment you cry out to the Father and you say, I'm in desperate need of a savior. At that moment, God credits to your account the very righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. And he takes your sin and puts it on Christ so that you can stand before God innocent. See, it all depends on God and not at all on you. Faith is simply the hand that receives the free gift of God in Christ Jesus. Herman Kuyper wrote this. He says, as little as a beggar who puts forth his hand to receive a piece of bread can say that he has earned the gift granted him, so little can believers claim that they have merited justification just because they have embraced the righteousness of Christ graciously offered to them in the gospel. Oh, that's good news, friends. Such good news. The only kinds of people God justifies are the ungodly who recognize that they cannot do any work to be justified and therefore cry out to God for a favor. Fourth thing I want you to see, and then we'll land the plane. The act of justification takes place the instant a sinner believes in Christ. Like, it's, it's, it's that quick. Which means that, that it's not, oh, I need, to, I, need, I need to go back home and figure out some things. I need to first uh, go to that class and complete it. I first need to read this book. No, 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 no. The moment you say, I receive, is the moment you are justified. Abraham believed and God counted it. He counted it. The day I believed, God counted it. The day you believed, he cut. Even this morning, even this morning, if you're sitting here and you're like, man, I've been going to church my whole life. Never heard this before. I just kind of assumed that my, Christ, my parents are Christian or I just assumed that I go to church or, or, or that when I fill out uh, forms and it's like, well, what are you, Christian? Yeah. No. It's t- to believe. It's to recognize and to say, I'm in need. And when you do that, it happens like this. It's, it's as instant as a judge reading a verdict and saying, not guilty. You know what they have to do? Immediately, they have to take off any chains that are on you. They have to, they have to let you out of that courtroom. They say, you're free. Go. You're free. It happens instantly. It's at that moment a soul passes from condemnation to innocence, from the sentence of death to life from darkness and the chains of sin to light and the liberty of God's free grace. And so my question, my question to you this morning is, do you, do you believe? Do you believe that at this moment you are right with God? And not because of anything that you have done, but because of what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. Can you right now in this very moment stand before a holy and just God and go, you know what? I'm going to be okay. That's a serious question that all of us need to be able to answer. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you're sitting here and you're going, well, I need to go figure out some things first. I'll settle that later. My fear is that you have not grasped this truth quite yet. And on top of that, you still believe that you're in control of your own life. How do you know you have this afternoon? How do you know you have tonight? How do you know you have tomorrow? It's that proud heart again. As Jonah likes to say, it's rearing its ugly head. Going, no, 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 don't don't listen to that. You're in control. You're in charge. 
you'll decide. Friends, freely receive. Freely receive. We do nothing. God does all the work. Paul, Paul, like, Paul is just, he's like, I really want to make sure that the church in Rome gets this. So, so he goes, okay, I've, I've, I've unpacked it with Abraham, but maybe some of you are still doubting. Let me give you another example. You, you all love David, right? King David. I mean, everyone loved David. David is our hero. We love him. And he says, okay, fine. Let, let's talk a little bit about David. See, David refers to just the, 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 the blessing of this doctrine of justification. What Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, verse 6 and 8, he says, Likewise, David also speaks of the blessing of the person to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the person the Lord will never charge with sin. David is saying the exact same thing. He's saying, fine, if you don't want to believe me, right, I get it. I'm Paul the Apostle. I used to persecute the church. I, I totally get it. I know you all love King David. Well, let's hear from him. He's, David is saying the same thing, which speaks of the blessing of all who receive God's righteousness apart from works. And David is no perfect person. We all love him, and he's a hero, and, but he's no perfect person. God, David had broken four of the Ten Commandments outright. He had coveted Bathsheba, committed adultery, lied about it, and murdered Uriah. And the Old Testament, its sacrificial system, it had no provision for such premeditated sin. This is why David cried out in Psalm 51, verse 16 to 17. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. Like he's, he's just going, what have I done? Okay, God, what sacrifice can I bring for your forgiveness? What, what can I, and he goes, he, he realized, no, no. You do not want burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, oh God. You know, I know all of us have prayer requests. Some of you don't want to share them because I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why. Share your prayer requests, but we all have them. We all have the, those things that we're hoping that God would do in and through our lives. We like please, God, would you do this? And, and, and I want to come alongside you and pray and get on my knees with you and pray. Like literally on Sundays, friends, this place should be, like up here, it should be filled with people just going, man, we, we're, we're trusting God for this. This is what I am in desperate need of. All of us have prayer requests. And we pray in expectation, but here's the thing, we don't know if God's going to do it. It doesn't mean that he's a mean God. No, he knows what you need. And so he'll give you what you need. It's not always what you think you need, but he, he'll meet you where you are. So we all have prayer requests and we're going, I'm praying in expectation, but I don't know if he's going to answer it. But you know what? I know that there is a prayer that God will answer every single time. I'm sure of it. And that prayer is God save me. He answers it every single time. 100%. He answers it all the time. You, show, you go, save me. Because I cannot save myself. He will answer it every time. You don't have to doubt him on it. David's case was hopeless. So was ours. And if you haven't crossed the line of faith, your case right now is hopeless. We cry out for mercy. Mercy. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I introed this uh, series by talking about the two criminals on either side of Jesus, the one is mocking him, and, 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 and well, the other one starts by mocking him and then realizes and looks upon the face of Jesus. The, the fact that a bloody, battered, bruised face of Jesus is still the most beautiful thing to look at. He looks upon the face of Jesus and, and he recognizes what he has done and, and, and the fact that he is guilty and that there's nothing that he can do that can save him. He cries out, remember me. That is mercy. If you're in here this morning and if you haven't cried out for mercy, I really pray that you would. Paul 
Paul refers to this as a, as, a, as a blessing. It's a blessing to receive this mercy. That the righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Let me land this plane on these last few verses that I hadn't really quite seen until I studied this passage a couple of weeks ago. You see, the intense Jewishness of Paul's argument could lead some at this point to assume that justification by faith alone was only for the Jews. Abraham and David. And there's a ton of people who are in the church going, I'm not Jewish. Like, I've heard of those names, but they're not my heroes. Impressive people, but they're not my heroes. And so folks could be sitting there going, is, this, is he only talking to the Jews? And so Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, verse 9, he asks the question, is this blessing only for the circumcised then? Or is it also for the uncircumcised? For we say faith was credited to Abraham for righteousness. He turns this question to the Gentiles. He says, guys, I see you. I see you. That's, that's beautiful because for, for many of us in here, we didn't grow up in church. We don't know the lingo. Or, or maybe we did in the beginning and then over time just kind of went and did our own thing. And now we believe the lie that we are beyond the grace of God. And so we go, it's not for me. Like my life is an absolute mess. The things that I have done, it's not for me. Paul writes, in what way then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? It was not while he was circumcised, but uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while still uncircumcised. This was to make him the father of all. who believe but are not circumcised, so that righteousness may be credited to them also. And he became the father of the circumcised, who are not only circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith of our father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. I know, it sounds like a tongue twister. It's one of those things that I'm sure you're gonna go home and you're gonna challenge one another. Can you read this thing three times as quickly as you can and let's see. It's one of those. But what Paul is doing here, as he lays out this argument, he's going, guys, this isn't just for a certain group of people. This is for all of us, no matter what you've done in your life. And I know, some, like, some of us feel like we've done the, the most heinous and horrendous things that there is no ways that God would forgive me. It's for everyone. Paul answers the, the question of, is this just for the Jewish people he answers it by going back to Abraham and saying, listen, let's, let's do some historical work here. Abraham was counted as righteous at least 14 years before he was circumcised. He's going, like there's some of you that are like elevating circumcision to a place that it does not belong. That it's now like, uh, are you circumcised? Uh, yes, you're saved. Are you circumcised? No, you're not saved. Like literally that was what was happening. And he goes, guys, do you, wait. He was justified at least 14 years before he was circumcised. That the circumcision is a seal. It's, it's like a sign. It's, like a, it's a sign of the seal. It's, 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 not, like it's not justification. Which again, he's going, it's not about works. Genesis 15, verse 4 to 6, tells us of the promise to Abraham that he would have an heir. Genesis 16, verse 16, states that he was about 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael as a result of attempting to help God bring about the promise, which many of us do, right? We feel like we can help God bring about his promises. Don't do that. Genesis 17 verse 24 indicates that Ishmael was 13 when he, this is Abraham, was about 99 years old. And when he circumcised his household, I'm just mapping the timeline here for you. Therefore, there is a space of some 14 years, assuming that Hagar became pregnant soon after Abraham's faith in Genesis 15, verse 6. He was justified long before he was circumcised. The point is this. Abraham was declared a righteous man while a Gentile himself. 
So, so he's, he's going, I know you Jewish people think, you know, you church people think, yeah, yeah, no, you know, we're the ones. The, the very person that you go, man, we elevate as a hero of our faith. He's like, well, he's technically a Gentile. And remained so for 14 to 29 years before he was a Jew. See, circumcision was a sign that you're Jewish. Therefore, justification by faith alone was a Gentile principle long before it was a Jewish reality. Justification by faith alone is for everyone. It is for Jew and Gentile. Abraham is the father of uncircumcised believers and the father of circumcised believers not on the ground of circumcision, but of their trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone. Through the unity of faith, Jews and Gentiles, hear this, our brothers and sisters. He, like, some of you go, man, gospel-centered disciple-making, why do you labor on this transcultural thing? Like, is this, is this like a, like, are you trying to be cool and like blend in with society, multi, no, no, no. We're, we're transcultural because we see it in the scriptures. We see it in the, right, right, right here. We're talking about the doctrine of justification and boom, transculturalism is right there. Justification includes people. It creates a culture of inclusion because it's not about where you grew up. It's not about how much money you have. It's not about what degrees you have. It's not about the color of your skin. It's not about the culture that you were raised up in. It's not whether you grew up in the church or didn't. No, no, no. It's about whether you cried out for mercy and you received the free gift. That's it. And so the church should be transcultural if that is the message that we are preaching. And so the call, call the band up and we'll close out in song, but the, the call is this. is that all of us can boldly approach the throne of grace. All of us. Oh, now you don't know what I did last night. All of us. You, you don't know the places I've been. All of us. All of us can approach the throne of grace and receive mercy and be justified. It is such a beautiful, such a beautiful doctrine for us to understand because, and it's gonna shape, it's gonna shape a lot of what we're going to do as we move forward, but, but I'm telling you, if you get this, if you recognize that in Jesus you've been declared innocent, the way we live we automatically become generous people. B because we're going, I can't, I can't believe. Like at one point, I was in the courtroom and like I, I know what I had done. I know that I'm guilty and, I, and I'm just waiting for the judge to go like 10 life sentences. You know, it's like you're at that point, you're like, I'm not even, I'm not even gonna look up. I don't, I don't care. I don't. And that's the posture of many of us. I see it in your body. Like when we worship the one who is seated on his throne for all that he has done, there's this posture of, like, but yeah, but my life, but like. All of us were there. And if you're given an opportunity to say, look, what, what do you want? If you, were, if you could be given, like, with all that you know that you have done, if you could be given. Anything, if you could be one thing, what would it be? Mercy. I know what I've done. I know who I am. Mercy. And then to hear the judge go, in Christ, receive. Now go and live as a free citizen of the kingdom of God. It changes everything. My hope is that you would lay hold of it. And so, Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you are a good, loving, faithful, merciful, gracious God. You are slow to anger, bounding in love. You are kind to us. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And so, God, would you be kind with us again this morning?
Father, I pray for those in this very room who, I mean, I know the context. I know the context of our country. And I know that most of us, we assume, we just assume that we're Christian. We assume that we're in right standing with you. And so I pray, I pray in this very moment for those who are in this room who are going for the first time I'm going I actually need to ask and answer that question for myself am I right with God Holy Spirit I pray that they would know that that answer can be yes in this very moment today right now all they have to do is receive just receive the free gift that is found in Jesus Christ that justifies us. And I pray for those who have crossed a lot of faith and maybe are weary and, and tired and, and doubt has crept in. Lord, I pray that you will remove all those things by the power of your spirit. That you would fan the flame. That you would renew, that you would awaken in us this this reality, this beautiful truth that we are loved more than we could ever imagine. We can boldly approach the throne of grace. And so help us, Lord, as we sing, how deep and how wide, how, I mean, you're so massive, you're so, and yet you're a God who is able to be intimate each and every one of us, that you meet us where we are. And so with the glorious God who is an intimate and loving Father, meet every heart here this morning. And let us boldly, 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 boldly approach the throne of Christ. We ask all of this in Jesus' name.